Are you noticing that your loved one is appearing disoriented, physically unsteady, and is neglecting personal hygiene? Is your loved one showing signs of decreased memory, attention, and concentration? Does the usually neat house now seem neglected? Are you concerned that these observations may be signs of a degenerative disease which can destroy memory, ability to learn, and ability to carry out daily activities? What can a caretaker do to improve the quality of life of a person suffering from Alzheimer's disease? Can a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's be safely cared for at home? How can one assure that an Alzheimer's patient feels loved, worthy, and understood? What daily care and communication challenges do caretakers encounter? How can a caretaker manage personality and behavior changes caused by a progression of Alzheimer's disease? To answer these and many other questions, my guest is Mal Allard, a registered nurse, Alzheimer's consultant, Alzheimer's advocate, and founder of a company called their real world. Her specialty is in the daily care and communication challenges of people suffering from dementia. As we like to do on this program, she stresses the importance of education. Mal, welcome to Money Your Life. It's great to have you on the program. Thank you for inviting me, Ramsey. Okay. I, the first question I have for you is that is, you know, people oftentimes will joke and say, you know, uh, when they can't remember a name or they can't remember a face or they become confused about something and say, I'm having a senior moment. And it's usually just considered a joke, and it's not anybody who's really suffering from dementia or anything. But there are, there are people who have these serious memory problems mm -hmm. uh, that ha do have dementia. And it's also known that there are other conditions that can mimic dementia, you know, like depression, like the use of alcohol, and so forth and so on. What should somebody do if they notice that they have a, a parent or a loved one who's having these kinds of memory difficulties? What should they do? Well, I think first they should consider, is this the first time they notice the change? Or is it ongoing? Um, are they noticing more difficulties, different difficulties in their daily life? Mm -hmm. and, and if this is what they are seeing, they need to get themselves to the doctor. They do need an evaluation um, from A to Z. Many times it's the primary care physician that will um, begin that evaluation with vital signs and regular testing and so forth um, and if all those appear to be within normal ranges uh, it moves forward from there they have uh, memory clinics mm -hmm. is what they call them there's one at Leahy one at Mass General one at Whittier and a neurologist will work with you to find out exactly what is going on is the problem reversible mm -hmm or is it not reversible? And, and most times when loved ones um, see these symptoms, um, most times the diagnosis for that would be an Alzheimer's type diagnosis. Now let's, let's say that in the, the scenario I just presented that the uh, loved one is diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Can an Alzheimer's patient still be cared for at home? Absolutely. Oh, that's good news. M yeah, most times people want to stay in their own home, be in their own environment because it's the same. It's their familiar. It's what they know. Um, there's so very many home care companies out there that help in a, to that help people stay in their home for as long as possible throughout the disease. Okay. Now let's let's say that somebody is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and they're they're living at home. How, how do the family members know that that person is safe to live at home? And again, a lot of times it's a simple assessment. You can have someone come in, a consultant. I do home assessments. There's mm -hmm. many people out there that do home assessments, possibly even the Alzheimer's Association, Elder Services, Minuteman, um, Senior Services do these type of home assessments. And we would go in there and look at everything from top to bottom. And every case is different. Um, is there risk of wandering? Mm -hmm. um, if they're living with someone else and the house is alarmed, the wandering isn't as much of an issue. If they're living by themselves and the highway is across the street mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. the lake in the backyard, mm -hmm. it's more of an issue. You have to find out, you, are they giving themselves their own medications or is there someone in the home mm -hmm. that is, is passing them sure. their medications? So it's all very, very individual. 
you know, what is their support system? Are they living in senior housing? Mm -hmm. Are they living in a private home? Mm -hmm. Are they living in a condominium? You know, what is the situation? And you go out and you start to assess from that point. You know, are they cooking still? Are mm -hmm. they using the stove? Are mm -hmm. they using the microwave? Mm -hmm. Um, little things that I tell the families to look for um, are there plastic bowls that are melted or, or you know pot holders that are singed or towels and things like that as well as stairs are there a lot of stairs and the ambulation is not too good mm -hmm. um, does the gentleman always want to go down to the basement and those stairs are mm -hmm. steeper mm -hmm. and smaller mm -hmm. so again it's very individualized but if you are staying at home or if the the person with memory loss is still living in their home um, they should should absolutely have someone come out to the home and assess what's going on and how to keep them safe not reasons why they can't stay there because they're not safe but how do we keep them there more safely by little things that we can do to keep them safe sure. well, that's, so. that's all that's all good information mm -hmm. now uh, your company uh, their real world has mm -hmm. a website mm -hmm. and on that website you talk about communicating with Alzheimer's patients mm -hmm. uh, could you please explain for our viewers why one has to change the way one communicates with an Alzheimer's patient and how should one change that communication? Well, people with Alzheimer's disease, not in the earliest stages, but as people progress into the mid stages, the middle stages of Alzheimer's disease, they perceive their world um, much differently than we perceive our world. How so? What do you mean? Well, if you go sensory, what do they see? What do they hear? What do they smell? If they're watching the five o'clock news on TV in middle stages of Alzheimer's disease and a baby has been kidnapped, um, it becomes their baby that's kidnapped, not, mm -hmm. not that baby that's on TV. Mm -hmm. um, if they hear sirens go by the house, they may think that those sirens are for them in that house. Mm -hmm. If we burn a bag of microwave popcorn in the microwave, we perceive it as burnt popcorn. They may well perceive that as the house burnt down. They perceive so many things differently than we do. Mm -hmm. You know that they have language difficulties, you know, word finding problems, and they comprehend differently mm -hmm. as well. So everything is in that mix, and we need to communicate with them through wherever they are right now within the disease. Mm -hmm. Is it, is it important when you're talking with a, with a person diagnosed with Alzheimer's, is it important to try to eliminate any of the stress? Foremost. Foremost? Foremost. Uh, the confusion. You know, if you have an Alzheimer's type diagnosis, a lot of the emotions that are generally felt, probably on a minute to minute basis mm -hmm. um, some of the times, is confusion and frustration, anxiety, mm -hmm. sometimes anger, because they know there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, in the earliest stages, they can even tell you their diagnosis. In, mm -hmm. in middle stages, they know that there's something wrong, but they can't explain to you mm -hmm. what is wrong with them. Oftentimes, I've, I've heard anyway, oftentimes you'll have a caregiver, you know, somebody who's, who's living with the Alzheimer's mm -hmm. patient, and the Alzheimer's patient will repeat the, the same the same comment or the same question mm -hmm. and they'll become really frustrated the caregiver mm -hmm. and and you know that creates a stressful situation for both the caregiver and for the patient mm -hmm. my question is is it really better to try to stay calm and patient and perhaps not even answer the question when the Alzheimer's patient asks the same question three or four times like you no know, when's dinner you know mm -hmm. and and you say well you know dinner is in three hours well mm -hmm. two minutes later when's dinner and two minutes later, when's dinner? Yeah. And, you know, that can create, in my view, a very stressful situation. For both so, people. So how yeah. do you eliminate that stress? Is it, first of all, you said it's important to eliminate that stress. So yeah. how do you eliminate the stress? What do you do? Well, I mean, you learn as much as you can about the disease and what's going on because of this disease, and especially the confusion because of their forgetfulness. And that causes stress for the person with the mm -hmm. diagnosis as well as for the caregiver who is on a daily basis perhaps what time is it and what time is it and what time right. it is 
Um, and the thing is, is, is the person with Alzheimer's disease really doesn't care what time it is. We can say it's 2 o'clock, it's 2 o'clock, it's 2.05, it's 2.10, and they'll ask you 50 times, and they don't care what time it is. What they're wondering is what they're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. So the Alzheimer's caregiver, once they learn how to effectively redirect them onto something else, you know, to divert their attention to something else, mm -hmm. then they don't care what time it is. You know, a lot of times someone with Alzheimer's disease will ask for their mother, their father, their husband, the wife that may well be deceased. Mm -hmm. And you need to look at that and think if they realize their mother has died or their husband has died, then they wouldn't be standing there right. asking us where they are over and over and over again because it just it's negative emotion negative emotion negative emotion so when the loved one you should learn you know um, ask for someone that has died many many years ago they don't want the physical person to necessarily walk through the door it means the person with Alzheimer's has a problem and their Alzheimer's does not allow them to explain this problem to you. Like, I have a headache and mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. I have to go to the bathroom mm -hmm. and I can't find the bathroom. Mm -hmm. I have to go to work, I don't know how to go to work. All right, so once the caregiver understands that, that this is their way of trying to communicate, they communicate through their behaviors, they communicate by asking for mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. who they don't remember are no longer there, the caregiver needs to take care of the problem from that point of view. So the Alzheimer's Association would call it a therapeutic fiblet. Mm -hmm. um, I say lie through your teeth when you must, mm -hmm. um, but only when you must. Right. So I might say, you know, if they said, did you see my mother, did you see her? I would say, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. You know, are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they hot? Are they cold? Do they feel lonely? Are they bored? A lot of times, especially at home, people with Alzheimer's disease, they get bored. They yeah. start feeling a little bit useless, you know. Mm -hmm. They're not very productive. So once the caregiver educates themselves um, as to what's going on and how they can help and that there's outside help mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. them, then sure. it will be a more successful journey for everyone. Now, is it important when you're communicating with a, an Alzheimer's patient, is it important to use visual cues, kind of, you know, show them what they have to do, show, mm -hmm. show them what you need done? Um, because, as you said, they, they do have some difficulties with normal communication. Mm -hmm. So are visual cues important? They are important. You want them to remain as independent as they can throughout the disease. And if, especially in the home setting that um, we're talking about right now, if they wanted to get a glass of water and there's 20 cabinets out there and they mm -hmm. don't know what door to open, you can put a picture of a glass and write, you know, drinking glass mm -hmm. underneath it. It's kind of like wayfinding. You can communicate sure. in that way. Sure. Mostly, I think, with communication in them maintaining independence is um, to simplify things. Mm -hmm this way here. Those are visual cues. You go into the bathroom, instead of having all kinds of things all over the sink, you remove them, just put the toothbrush, just put the toothpaste, mm -hmm. just put the hairbrush. Right. So that is our way of helping them. Sure. I'm in this room to brush my teeth right. and to comb my hair. Right. And, and, and those items remind the person of that. That's right. Now, now how about um, uh, social activities, and I'm going to give you a, a, a scenario that, that I actually experienced many years ago. Went up to visit some friends at Lake Winnipesaukee in New Hampshire, and I was warned in advance that, you know, gr Grandma was having some issues. I don't think back then they called it Alzheimer's, but she was having some sort of issues. And I noticed that as more and more people came together, it was a Fourth of July function, as mm -hmm. more and more people came together for the cookout and everything, that she really became really, really upset, mm -hmm. Grandma did. Um, can Alzheimer's patients participate in those sort of t social activities? And if, if they can, what should family members do to prepare them for those activities? Well, I, I think that they can. And I think that they should be as social as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. But it's the family members that need to notice the changes 
from year to year. Mm -hmm. And here we are at Thanksgiving, and a lot of people will pick up their loved one with memory loss and bring them to that huge family gathering. And they may do very, very well, forgetting some names, but happy to see all the familiar faces. Mm -hmm. Come a year from now, the same thing may happen as with your grandmother. And the, the more people that come in, the more anxious they get. Mm -hmm. They don't know their names. They, they don't know the people. They don't know the answers to some of the questions that they're being asked. So at that point, you really can't cue all of the guests and all mm -hmm. of the family exactly, mm -hmm. you know, how to communicate with grandma, but you would probably invite her to smaller family mm -hmm. settings mm -hmm. at a time. Or if you know she can tolerate the larger one for 45 minutes to an hour, then let her join in for 45 mm -hmm. minutes to an hour and have a family member that's prepared to, to bring her back to her home or to wherever, wherever she resides at that time. Are there, you know, other than the, these family get-togethers, are there other, other things that agitate al Alzheimer's patients? Because I've read that they are easily agitated. And, you know, what agitates them and what can somebody do to try to, you know, avoid that agitation? Well, I, I, they get easily agitated because they're so confused. Mm -hmm. And then they get very frustrated within that confusion. And sometimes, and probably most of the time, it's us who are visiting them or communicating with them and approaching them that cause a lot of that anger and upset. Not all of it, but we do. You know, you'll, you'll hear the classic stories of, you go up to this person in the middle stages of Alzheimer's disease and there's a barrage of questions mm -hmm. that you want to ask them and they don't remember the answers to all of those questions or if we give them a task that's not failure free for them anymore you know we're, we're telling them you know here take this glass bring it into the kitchen rinse it out with water and put it on the counter right. and they, they might just start and you can see their anxiety level rise because it was too much for them to remember at once. Mm -hmm. It becomes very difficult for them to sequence things like that. So if we learn to ask them to do one thing at a time that we know they can do successfully, that would be a better approach and um, they wouldn't get so agitated in that. A lot of times we might, year after year, we might forget to be polite. Mm -hmm. We might forget to smile. Mm -hmm. We might forget to call them by name. Can you imagine being in, in your house and in your friend or your wife or your daughter comes around the corner and you don't recognize in that one moment who mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. and then they start telling you what to do perhaps. Right. Um, that's very frightening for mm -hmm. them. You know, they'll, they'll defend themselves also right, in any right, situation right. that they feel unsafe in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, you know, so, sometimes as you were mentioning, you know, they, uh, at a certain stage, the Alzheimer's patient won't recognize people anymore. Yeah. They're going to forget birthdays and anniversaries and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, isn't it important for the family member not to react to that? Isn't it and not, not to say, well, geez, how could you not remember who I am? How yeah. could you not remember it's Johnny's birthday? He's yeah. your grandson? Yeah. Isn't it important that they say, look, this person's got an illness, yeah. and it's the illness, it's not the person yeah. that's speaking? It's a progressive brain disease yeah. um, that they didn't ask for, that they don't want to have, and that none of us have any control over whatsoever. I think if we go with, you know, they, they f forgot your name, they forgot the relationship while you're visiting, you need to put things in perspective. That's not the important part, that they remember your name, that they remember the relationship, and it's not fair to them that we're reactive mm -hmm. instead of taking a step back in realizing that even though they don't know your name and they don't know or remember the relationship, they remember your face, mm -hmm. and they remember your voice, and they remember your smile, and your smell and your touch, or the, mm -hmm. foot, you know, the footsteps mm -hmm. coming down the hallway. Um, that they do remember. They remember that they trust this person that they're seeing, and they love this person, and that's what becomes important, not the names and the relationships and, and birth dates right. and anniversary right. dates right. and things right. like that. From what sort of stimuli can an Alzheimer's patient most benefit? I think mostly from things that are familiar to them that they've enjoyed over the years, especially years and years and years ago. 
you know they always love music there's so many different types of music so we would play the music that they liked a lot of people enjoy watching I Love Lucy the men the honeymooners mm -hmm. other people might like opera you know um, painting mm -hmm. you know did, did they like museums mm -hmm. before did mm -hmm. You know, did they like boats? Did they like animals? Did they enjoy babies and caring for babies? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that they knew and loved and enjoyed to do. Now, what about colors? Are colors important? Colors, color contrasting is, is very, very important. Um, primary colors are always best. They can see them the easiest. Mm -hmm. But we have a white paper on top of the dark desk. Mm -hmm. They would be able to see the paper. Mm -hmm. If I had a piece of blue paper here on top of it and said, please get me the paper, they may not see it. Mm -hmm. They do have a lot of times poor depth perception um, and live successfully or more successfully and independently by color contrasting. Mm -hmm. The banister on the stairs needs to be a, a totally different color than the walls there beside. Okay. Okay. You know, you need to have a bath mat at the bottom of the tub that they can see like mm -hmm. bright blue mm -hmm. or orange, mm -hmm. or they can't see the bottom of the okay. tub. All right. are, are there any sort of smells that are a positive for an Alzheimer's patient? This, a lot of anything, again, I think that's enjoyable to them. Mm -hmm. A lot of places you'll go into and they're baking cookies mm -hmm. or an apple pie or they're baking bread. A lot of people will actually have aromatherapy, mm -hmm. maybe with some of the, you know, the citrusy smells mm -hmm. or lilacs and orchids and things like that. Some will help them pep up a little. Some will calm them down a little. Yeah, that's all important stuff for family members to understand and, and yeah. know. And the, it gets to your point earlier of, again, educating themselves, yep. becoming more educated exactly. about how to work with a person like this. You know, you wonder why dad almost falls on the floor every time he goes to sit on the chair because he can't see the chair. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, the carpet might be tan and the chair might be brown and right. he just can't figure where the center of that chair is. So I'll, I'll, the more we educate ourselves and the more we know, the more successful we'll be as a caregiver right. and they will be as a person who has memory impairment. Okay, now are there other resources that family members can turn to to try to learn more about Alzheimer's because you know, our show is all about education. Mm -hmm. You're all about education. Yeah. So how can people educate themselves? Well, I think they need to get out to some of the, the little seminars and conferences that are going on. You can find them in your local newspapers. You can access the Alzheimer's Association. They're a world of information mm -hmm. um, in, in helping the caregivers out there, but also offering me many educational opportunities. A couple of books that I recommend um, right now in in my presentations is one is learning to speak Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and it's just an absolute wealth of helpful compassionate respectful mm -hmm. and humorous information from A to Z and a new book I came across someone um, gifted it to me and it's, it's called love loss and laughter mm -hmm. seeing Alzheimer's differently um, now Oftentimes, people will not do what are called advanced directives, mm -hmm. durable powers of attorney, mm -hmm. living wills, um, health care proxies, that sort of thing. It's, it's, my, it's my experience that people who fail to do that and end up being diagnosed with dementia mm -hmm. find themselves in a very awkward spot. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have an agent who can make health care decisions for them and they don't have someone who can now pick up the ball and handle their, their financial matters and that puts them in a situation of having to apply for a guardianship or a conservatorship mm -hmm. which is a much more, it's a much more expensive and more burdensome process than mm -hmm. actually signing these advanced directives. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's important that people get these advanced directives sooner rather than later? Absolutely. I should do my own. <laughs> we should all. <laughs> I haven't done my own yet. Um, but absolutely. You know, many, many people notice early on that they have symptoms of some type of a memory impairment. And especially when they notice that, those are some of the very first things that they should do. Because as the, the disease progresses, they can't always make. Right. their own decisions right. um, appropriately. I want to make my own decisions. I want to make my own choices. I think it's so important um, in the earliest stages of the memory impairment or noticing mm -hmm. the symptoms mm -hmm. even before the diagnosis. You know, be evaluated. Be evaluated if you think that there's something wrong. And if you do have like a mild cognitive impairment, don't, don't walk, right. run if right. you're already at that stage. Right. 
get to your lawyer, fill out these legal forms as soon as possible because it's your life, it's your disease, and these are your decisions and you still have control over them at that time. Yeah, I think I think it's absolutely crucial. I'm sure you're not surprised that that's my opinion, yeah. but you know it's absolutely <laughs> crucial because, as you said, I mean, you know, if you if you don't name these people, then you put yourself in a really really awkward spot. You really do. I think it's a good place for us to stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Today we learned that Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's a progressive disease that slowly destroys a person's memory, judgment, and functionality. Just like the rest of our bodies, as we age, our brains change. Although we all notice some occasional age-related slowed thinking and memory loss, serious memory loss, confusion, language difficulties, and other major changes are not a normal part of aging. Such difficulties, in fact, may be a sign of Alzheimer's disease. My guest, Mal Allard, shared with us that effective communication with a person suffering with Alzheimer's requires patience, understanding, and good listening skills. Decreasing the stress of both the caregiver and the person suffering from Alzheimer's is crucial. To do so, it is recommended to speak slowly, clearly, and with a calm voice. Use short, simple words and sentences. Don't rush, don't show annoyance. Avoid criticizing or correcting. Be patient. Adjusting your behavior in these ways will likely establish a positive pattern of communication, leading to a reduction of stress, anger, and conflict. Less conflict evokes more happiness. More happiness results in better caregiving. In other words, the goal in all communications with a person suffering from Alzheimer's disease should be to connect in a positive, constructive, and effective way. Don't overlook the power of touch. By incorporating gentle touch in your communication, you may find that your loved one feels more loved, important, and understood. Also make maximum use of visual stimulation or cues. For each one of us, vision is important as it offers the broadest range of possibilities for stimulation. For Alzheimer's patients, visual stimulation can involve light, color, shape, motion, or a combination of these elements. These visual stimuli may stimulate memory and improve mood. If your loved one is suffering from Alzheimer's disease, it's important to educate yourself. For as Ben Franklin is quoted as saying, an investment in knowledge always pays the best interest. It is only through education that you will discover the keys to developing a more positive interaction. In closing, thanks to my guest, Mal Allard, for participating on this program. And as always, thank you to you, our viewers, for watching Your Money, Your Life. My name is Attorney Ramsey Barawi, building your trust.